I want you to take your Bibles tonight and find the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and go to the 20th chapter. And I'm sure that uh, this passage of Scripture, sometime over the years I've preached it, I know, but never this message. And I've preached every night to the church, to the body, but, but tonight I want to preach a message that's among the most sobering, if not most sobering, in the Word of God. And I don't, everybody here may be a Christian, but they're not. That's not a judgmental statement, it's just the truth. But every Christian needs to be reminded of this message. I'm preaching tonight on this subject, face-to-face with Judge Jesus. Face-to-face with Judge Jesus. I want you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Everybody standing. Revelation chapter 20, and I'm going to ask in a moment, there'll be as little moving about as possible. Uh, You're always awesome. Students, y'all are fantastic. But uh, you say, Brother Rick, if I run around, will it bother you? No, but somebody may need to hear the Word of God tonight. Book of Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. John said this, writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'm preaching tonight on this subject face to face with Judge Jesus. Face to face with Judge Jesus. Thank God for the reading of his perfect word. Please be seated. Would you do that? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, the first thing I do tonight is praise your name. Thank you for the wonderful privilege to be in a service like this. God, I thank you for a full house of people and a great crowd that's come out on a rainy night, Lord, to praise you and hear your word. And I thank you for what you've done this week. God, I thank you for filled altars and praying saints and forgiveness and and all the things you've taught us this week. But God, somebody in this house needs this word tonight. So God, I pray that my enemy could not do anything to snatch precious seed. I pray that he would be dismissed from this place. And we know he's allergic to praise because he's not here. He can't be. But keep him from this place. My God, would you give me unction, anointing. My God, would you loose me and let me go. And God, I promise you tonight that I'll give you the glory for everything you'll do right now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, God's word is truth. I still love the story of the little first grade boy that went to Sunday school one day and heard the story about how Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. A few days later, he was at grandparents' house and he was in the big family room by himself and he picked up that big old family Bible they had forever sitting on the coffee table. And that little boy began to thumb through that big old Bible that was so old and saw all the pictures and the memories and as he began to flip through the pages, All of a sudden, a leaf, a big old leaf that grandma had pressed years before, a big old leaf went fluttering out of the Bible, and that leaf fell down on the ground. Little boy broke out screaming, bloody murder. About that time, grandma ran in thinking he was hurt and said, oh, son, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, oh, grandma, we got a problem. She said, what is it? He said, I'm pretty sure Adam just lost his underwear. (laughs) I said, I'm going to tell you about that little boy. That little boy believed the Word of God. Now, let me tell you all something. I believe the Word of God. I believe every letter and every line. I believe every sentence and every statement. I believe every phrase and I believe every page. And students, if I believe every page of the Word of God, then I've got to believe this page, which I believe is the saddest page in all of the Bible. And it is a page that describes when multiplied millions, billions, will stand face to face with Judge Jesus. That's what the Word of God says. Look at verse number 12 of of Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Uh, That word stand means to have an appointment. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that all these people at this future prophetic event are standing now before the judge. The Bible said because they have an appointment. You know what God's doing? God is pushing back the curtain, allowing us to look into the future. And we are looking at the last judgment of man. We are looking at what is called the great white throne judgment in which they will stand before Judge Jesus. Can I just be honest? Everybody in this building will one day be face to face with Jesus. Everybody here. Everybody here is going to face Jesus one way or another. So you're either going to face him as the Lamb of God or you'll face him as the Lion of Judah. 
You're either going to face him as your savior or as your judge. You're either going to face him in the clouds or you're going to face him in the courtroom. And since I believe this courtroom is going to happen, you know what I've decided? I've decided to settle out of court. I've decided I don't want to wait for that day. I've decided, teenagers, that the first time I see Jesus, the first time I see his face is when I fly up to meet him in the clouds. I want to see Jesus face to face when I sing to him from the choir. I want to see Jesus face to face when I sit with him at the supper table. I want to see Jesus face to face when I'm walking streets of gold. I do not want to wait till this event. Because I'm telling you, if you wait till this event to see Jesus face to face, it will be too late. For you will be face to face with Judge Jesus. Three simple things I want to say about the judge tonight. Three of simple things in the simplest of sermons I want to say about the judge. Number one, I want you to see the vision of the judge. The vision of the judge. Look what it says in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Students, that phrase literally means there will be no place to hide. Everything opens up, no place to hide. We were in Disney World, oh, several years ago, taking our grandchildren. And my little granddaughter, Ansley, was three at the time, and she knows that I'm a soft touch, and that I'll pretty much get her, admire most of the things she wants, within reason. And Ansley and I, we were in that big store on Main Street. I don't know where the, where the rest of the family were, the rest of the grandkids, and Judy, and, and the, the, the son-in-laws, and daughter-in-law, and, and children. I don't know where they were somewhere, but for some reason, Ansley and I are kind of by herself in a section of that store. And she began to put in to me to buy her some candy. And I said, no, baby doll, we're going to wait. We're fixing to have dinner. I'll buy you some candy later. And for just a moment, I took my eyes off of her, just a moment, and I looked on the shelf at something. It just took a moment. And when I looked back, she was gone. I couldn't find her. And I began to have a little mild panic rise. I mean, we're talking about Disney World. We're talking about all those people there. And I'm looking quickly and just in my little periphery all around that area, and she was not there. And I stepped, I was right by the door, so I stepped out and looked up and down the sidewalk, and she was not there. And I'm telling you, I'm just beginning to have a little bit of a meltdown inside. And all of a sudden, I looked behind the rack of candy, and I saw that little brunette head. And she's peering around that corner looking at me, and I was so relieved that I walked over to her, and I said, baby girl, I said, you scared me. She said, I was hiding from you. I said, I know. I said, honey, let's not tell anybody what just happened right here and that I lost you. And my little three-year-old granddaughter looked at me and said, buy me some candy. I kid you not. Y'all know what that girl did? She had me, buddy. That's what she did. She had me. It's amazing, students. I'm a fairly intelligent guy, I believe, with a pretty decent education, but a little three-year-old managed to hide from me. And, and we can do that. Man, you can hide from your parents. You can hide from your peers. You can hide from your pastor. Man, you can hide from your friends and your family and your folk. You can hide from your spouse, and you can hide from your siblings, but you can't hide from God. A lot of people have tried to hide from God. Adam and Eve ran to the garden to hide, but God found them. Moses ran to the desert to hide, but God found him. Jonah ran to the bottom of a boat to hide, but God found him. Students, the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 6 that one day macho men and strong men and mighty men are going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to follow them and hide them from the face of the one on the throne. See, there's a vision here. Don't miss this because we're on holy ground. Uh, there's a vision. I want you to see the vision of the judge. We'll say two things about what John sees in the vision. First of all, the nature of the judge that John is seeing. And John makes this statement in the first line of verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. How descriptive. How descriptive. A great white throne. I was in a prayer meeting one night with a group of deacons before a revival meeting. And I know this old boy was well-meaning, this old deacon. But he was praying. And in the middle of the prayer meeting, he said, oh, God, we can't wait till that day when we see you at the great white throne. And I thought, don't pray that for me, man. I don't want to see God at the great white throne. Can I hear an amen? Amen. See, students, great white throne. Everybody say great white throne. Great white throne. How descriptive. The word throne is found 165 times in your Bible. But there is no throne like this throne. This is not the throne that Matthew 25, 31 describes when Jesus said he'll be coming in the clouds of glory on his throne. This is not the throne of Luke 1, where Gabriel told Mary the little baby that was going to be born would ascend to the throne of David. This is not that throne. This is not the throne that we read about in Hebrews 4.16, where the Bible says as believers, we boldly become, come before the throne of grace. This is not the throne we find in Revelation 5.6, when we're gathered in that grace, praise gathering, meeting in heaven, and we're singing worthy is the lamb that was slain who is seated on the throne. It's not that throne. Students, this is the great white throne. It's not just a throne. 
See, in Bible days, a throne was reserved for a king. But in this throne, the king is a judge. And the judge is a king. So he don't just call it a throne. He calls it a great white throne. Very descriptive. For instance, he uses the word great. And great just simply means the size of it. The largest courtroom in world history multiplied b -b -b billions, I believe, will be there. The largest ever. So also, it's the highest court in history. There'll never be another like this. So he calls it great, but that's not the word. Then he calls it white. He doesn't just want us to know it's a great throne. He wants us to know it's a great white throne. Because white represents the dazzling purity and the awesome holiness, the nature of the one on the throne. For I'm telling you, here's what John's seeing. John's seeing a vision of someone on the throne who there is none like. He's got over 300 names in the Bible. The one that John sees on the throne, artist, have used paintbrush to try to describe him, but it can't be done. Preachers have used words to try to describe him, but it cannot be accomplished. Singers and writers have exhausted ink to try to write songs about this one on the throne, but it cannot be done. For he's got a nature like no other nature. And we can exhaust the alphabet, for he is alpha, and he is bridegroom, and he is counselor, and he is day star, and he is Emmanuel, and he is the fairest of 10,000, and he is the highest of the highest. He is the lily of the valley. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the master and the mighty and the magnificent. He is the one who never fails. He is omniscient, omnis, uh, omni, om, omnipresent. He is the one on the throne today, and he'll be on the throne tomorrow. Nobody's going to kick him off the throne. He is the prince of peace. He's the quickener of my soul. He is the redeemer and the rock of ages and royalty and the resurrection and the life. He is the savior and the stalwart and the sovereign. He is the triumph and the tower over my enemy. He is undefeated. He is invincible. He is wonderful. He is the everlasting God. He's the one on the throne. John says, John says, John says it is a great white throne. That's the nature. I'm not finished. For when he sees the vision of the judge, not only does he talk about the nature of the judge, but the name of the judge. What's his name? I've already given you a bunch of them, but let's call him by his name. First, what he says in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was a comedian in Las Vegas last year who lampooned Jesus, made fun of the name of Jesus. And when he finished, a reporter asked that comedian, Aren't you afraid to talk about Jesus Christ that way? And that comedian said this. This is a quote. said, it don't matter. Even if he exists, I will never see him. That guy's mistaken. For who is the name of the one sitting on the throne? It's him. He says him. And students, when he uses the word face, he means a real face. He's not talking about apparition. He's talking about a face. Who is the face on the throne? I, you know who it is. It's him. It's him. He's the one that the shepherds came to kneel before in the manger and said, that's him. He's the one that was in the temple at 12 years old, astounding all the philosophers and leaders of the day. They said, that's him. He's the one on the seashore that day that the disciples laid their nets down to follow him. He's the one when a storm was going to capsize the boat, the disciples looked up and saw him walking on the water. He is the one who him was the man Bartimaeus saw when his blind eyes all of his life were set free and he looked upon him. He is the one who stood before Lazarus' tomb and when the mummy came out alive and well, he he saw him. He is the one that the thief on the cross was promised he would see him today in paradise. He is the one that I will see in the clouds. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. Him is Jesus Christ. And what's amazing is there's a lot of people that still don't understand Jesus is the judge. Amen. Students, it's Jesus. How you know, Rick? John 5, 22 says, God judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the son. The Bible says in Romans 2, 16, that Jesus will judge the secrets of men. It's Jesus. And I don't say with any vindication. I don't say with vengeful as Brother Gary. I say with a broken heart. On that day, every eye shall see him. Every blaspheming comedian will look up and realize he's not a joke. He's the judge. Every atheist will realize he's not extinct. He's eternal. Every skeptic will realize he's not dead. He's deity. Every religion in the world will realize he's not just a man. He is the master. He's the one that'll have the last word. He's Jesus. The vision of the throne is the vision of the judge. Billy Graham, great preacher, when he was a young preacher, just starting as an evangelist, gaining notoriety, was driving through a small town in North Carolina, got pulled by the local police for speeding. 
And that little town had an ordinance that if you were pulled for speeding in that town, you had to immediately go to court and face the sentence and pay the fine. So Billy Graham, the young preacher, went to the court. The judge hit the gavel on the desk, said, how do you plead? Billy Graham looked at the judge and said, your honor, I'm guilty. The judge said, that will be $10, a long time ago. And Billy Graham reached for his wallet, got ready to pull out the $10, and suddenly the judge recognized the notable young preacher. Recognized who he was talking to, who he was dealing with, the great young evangelist, Billy Graham. And the judge did an amazing thing. He told the bailiff to go next door to the next court and bring the judge over. And the bailiff went and the judge came over and the judge stood up from his desk and unzipped his robe and laid it down and told the judge who had just come in, he said, this man here is guilty, but I'm going to take his place and pay his fine. If you'll sit the bench. And that judge came, and sat down in his robe and that other judge walked around, said, your honor, I plead guilty, but I'd like to pay the $10 fine. And then he turned to Billy Graham and said, now preacher, I'd like to take you to dinner because you've been a blessing to me. And when Dr. Graham later told that story, he said, what a picture of mercy and grace. Someone took his place. Someone paid his fine. Then someone blessed his life. Can I tell everybody what happened when King Jesus came to the earth? The king of all glory laid aside his royal regal robes and he stepped off of a throne room and came down to the slime of this earth, left the royalty of heaven and came to the gutter of this globe and he put on human flesh. The Bible said that flesh was nailed to a cross to die for my sins. He laid aside his kingly robes. He came and took my place. Hallelujah. But I'm going to say something to you. One day he'll not unzip his robe. One day he'll not lay them aside. If you wait till that day, you'll stand before him. He will be the judge. And that judge will not take your place. You'll have to pay for your sin. That's what happens at the vision of the judge. I'm not finished. First, I want you to see the vision of the judge. Second thing I want you to do is hear the voice of the judge. It's good now. First, there's the vision, and then there's the voice. Look what the Bible says in verse number 11, and I'll be finished with it. It said, I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Notice the phrase fled away, y'all. Students, that means to run away, to sprint away. Heaven and earth will run like a scalded dog at the sight of the one on the throne. The stars will refuse to twinkle. The moon will refuse to shine because of the one on the throne. Running away from the judge. Trying to. I remember when I was growing up, I was nine years old. I got a lot of whippings in my life. I, um, I had a whipping daddy. I, I got a whipping one time when I threw my glove down on the little league field because we had lost and I hated the other team and my daddy spanked me with his glove. I picked up my glove and spanked me with it. I, I got a bad whipping uh, uh, another time when I smart mouthed my mother and I, and I remember my daddy behind me. That was a bad day. But the worst whipping I ever got was when I was nine years old and my sister, who was about four years younger than me, was in my face. And she always told on me and she always ratted me out and she's right there in my face gonna tell dad something and I balled up my fist and I balled it up. And she was like five and I was like nine and, and I was going to swing my fist but not hit her. I never meant to hit her. All I meant to do was take my fist and let the wind blow in her face as I brought that uppercut, I just wanted to put the fear of God in her, man. And so I brought that fist up and uppercut. I never meant to hit her, but I caught her on the end of the chin and I knocked her in the air and on the ground, didn't kill her because she jumped up and ran in the house, buddy, screaming for daddy. And when she did, I ran to the cornfield. We lived in the country. My granddaddy Coram had a cornfield and I ran to the cornfield. And in a few moments, my daddy's standing there with a belt in one hand and my sniveling, crying sister who could have won an Academy Award in the other hand. And my daddy looked right at the cornfield and said, Rick, come here, boy. And I had no idea how my daddy's students could see me in the cornfield. But my daddy said, come here, boy. And I stepped out of that corn and I started to walk toward my dad. And here's power. My dad said, run, son. And I picked up my feet and began to run. I thought about that later. I was running to a beating. I was running to a whipping. I'm running to a belt like I've lost my mind. And when I got to my daddy, I don't have two free arms tonight. 
My daddy took me in one hand by the arm and he took that belt in the other hand and we're having a merry-go-round while my daddy's wearing out my behind and the whole time my daddy's hitting me, he's saying, look at me, look at me. And I'm saying, I can't look at you. He's doing it back here and I'm looking straight ahead. Anybody have a daddy like that? When my daddy finished spanking me, I fell on my face in the grass because I still didn't want to look at him. That's a silly story, but this is not. Nobody standing there that day is going to want to look at the king. Nobody. You understand? The Bible says the universe is going to run from him to keep from looking at him. Nobody's going to want to look at him, and it's because of that voice. Why? Do not miss this if you miss any part of the sermon. Do not miss this. Understand what kind of voice is going to sound out that day. It will be the voice of authority. Look what it says, the, the power of verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God's students, a resurrection from the dead. Then he says in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. The voice of the one on the throne is going to raise the dead. Did you know there's a ministry in America that believes they can raise the dead? You can't make this stuff up. I'm not putting anybody down, but the preacher's name's Tyler Johnson. He's in Texas. And there's 11 of them, and they're called the Dead Raising Team. They got t-shirts and everything, man. They got a website and everything. They're called the Dead Raising Team. And they claim Matthew 10, 18, where Jesus said, you'll heal the sick and raise the dead. And if you'll pay them a significant honorarium and buy their plane ticket and put them up in a hotel and feed them, they will come and raise your loved one from the dead. They'll come. I'm not making this up. They, they claim they'll come and put their hands on the dead person, embalmed in the coffin, and they'll raise them from the dead. They claim they've raised 11 people from the dead. They have no videos. I'd have a video, wouldn't you? They have no videos. They have no testimonials. They have no medical records. They have no doctor's approval, but they claim they can raise the dead. Say, Brother Rick, you believe that? I got a good Greek word. You might want to write it down. Baloney. Nobody can student, nobody can raise the dead. Everybody hear me? Nobody. Nobody living on this earth can raise the dead. Not a pope, not a preacher, not a pastor. Not an elder, not an evangelist. Not a missionary, not a musician. Nobody can raise the dead on this earth, but I know a man who can. The one who declared that he himself was the resurrection and the life. Look at me. He's going to raise the dead. Because it's amazing, Brother Gary, how many people still don't understand this. Students, I'm asked all the time by students, what happens when a person dies? When a person dies, what happens? And get it right. It's amazing how many people, and I'm not putting anybody down, but it's simple. Understand this. When a Christian dies, see, the real you is not this. The real you is inside of you. It's called your soul. And at death, the soul is separated from the body. If you die, they're going to have a funeral for you, perhaps in this church. And people are going to come, and they're going to look at your body, but you're not there. At the very second, you hear me? The very second. The very second that breath leaves your body and your heart stops, your soul leaves your body. The real you leaves you because this can't get into heaven. And the real leave you leaves here and checks out. If you're saved, you're going up. Say, how you know? That's where heaven is, boys. Up. Jesus ascended up. So I'm going up. Heaven's up. But if you're lost... When you die, your soul is separated instantly from your body and you go to the center of the earth. I believe it's in the earth. Luke chapter 16, it's a place called Hades, hell. It is not the final place of the dead. But everybody that's lost, student, everybody that's lost, that dies without Christ, everybody, religious people, those who are not really saved, they immediately go to a place called hell and that's where their soul will stay until this moment. And at this moment, he will call you up Oh yeah, can he do that? Oh yeah. yeah. He'll call you up and that soul will be reunited with that body no matter how long it's been in the grave and you will stand at this judgment. You'll be there. Can you imagine the crowd in front of that judgment? Oh, come on man, all the blasphemers, all the criminals, all the people who didn't acknowledge God. But I tell you what's going to be there, and I really believe this, Brother Gary. I believe a great throng that will be in that judgment are people who were religious. I believe there will be people who are church members. I believe there will be people who are Baptist. I be- there will be preachers there. There will be singers there standing at that judgment. 
and you're not going to be able to hide. You will not be able to cover yourself up in the coffin. You'll not be able to pull the lid over and say, I'm not coming. The same voice that called Lazarus out of the grave is going to call you up before this judgment. It's the voice of authority, but I'm not finished. I've got to preach this now. It's not only the voice of authority, it's the voice of accountability. For now look what he says in verse 12. I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. He says that again in verse 13 students. The last line says they were judged every man according to their works. Everybody get a hold of this if you don't get nothing else. Students the Bible teaches us by this passage that everything you do in life as a lost person is recorded. I'm just preaching stuff somebody needs to hear. Everything you do in life is recorded. Because the Bible said God's got books. Say, Rick, what kind of books does God have? Well, he's got a book of words. Oh, he does. Matthew chapter 12 says, our words condemn us and our words justify us. And you'll give an account for every idle word on the day of judgment. Or you say, God can't do that. Are you out of your mind? I say that in love. That sounded harsh, didn't it? Are you serious? Hey, you know what happened to me this year, preacher? I was at a church. I told you there's five or six churches I was to go to yearly. I was at a church for the 29th consecutive year, a church in Tennessee. Church I've gone to more than any other church. Do you know what happened shortly before I went to that church? I was rummaging around my office, and Judy will tell you this. I found an old cassette tape of me back in the early 90s when I first went to that church. And I got a hold of a cassette player, and I played that tape, oh my lamb, of me. I was in, that, in that tape, I was describing my two-year-old son. He's 30. In that tape, I was describing my eight-year-old daughter. She's got an eight-year-old daughter. And in that tape, I was describing that I was losing my hair. It's done. <laughs> Soon as it was a tape of me from, what, 29 years ago. Are you kidding me? If a man could put that on what we used to call a cassette tape or a CD, I believe God can handle this, don't you? Every time you say no to Jesus, it's recorded. Every time you reject the Savior, it's down. Every time the size of the crowd kept you from coming to Christ, God's got a record of it. The Bible says my God's got records. And you say, but preacher, what's God got of you? What did God do with your records? God can't see my records. They're covered by blood. Do you understand me? Every bad thing I've ever done has been washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. And when God looks at me, God sees blood. Don't you tell me to calm down. You just need to know I'm trying to restrain myself. Son, I don't deserve to go to heaven, but bless God I'm going, son, because of the blood of Jesus. Bible says... Bible says lost people will stand before God and God's going to open these books of students. God's going to open a book of works. Ecclesiastes says that every work will be brought into judgment. That money you took off your parents' dresser, you thought nobody was looking. That lie you told to your friend. That time you were looking at pornography on the internet and you were by yourself in your room. That time you had that unforgiving spirit and you refused to move or bend or budge. The time you rebelled against your mom and dad. So at the time you were out of town and your wife didn't know what you were doing, but God did. Do you understand? All of that is being recorded. Say, Rick, what are you trying to say? I'm not trying to say it. Can I say it very clearly and I'll quickly go to my last point? I hear these people all my life, Brother Gary, say this, uh, but I'm good. I'm good. And that's what we do. You, you, you know what we do? We compare ourselves to the criminal and the rapist and the atheist, but I'm good. I'm, I'm a good moral person, but there is none good, no, not one. If you died on your best day, you'd bust hell wide open. Nobody's good enough to get into heaven. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. But here's what good people are going to do, Brother Gary. I know it. I know it. I know it. They're going to stand before God, and they're going to throw themselves down before the mercy of the court and talk about all the goodness they've done in their life, and they're going to talk about how wonderful they were, but the books have been opened. Can I make a simple statement? You will testify against yourself on the day of judgment. And I'm going to say it one more time, and I know nobody likes preaching like this, before I quickly go to my last point. The tragedy of tragedies is there's going to be a lot of church members there. Our churches are full of lost church members, man. There's some of you right now, you've prayed sinner's prayer 20 times, been to the altar a bunch of times, been to student camp and walked down the aisle many times, but there's never been a change in your life. You're lost. I don't know if you know Daniel Cruz. Hey, thank you, brother. That's a note from my granddaughter. I dropped it. 
I don't know if y'all know Daniel Cruz, great music evangelist. Brother Gary does. Daniel's one of the most gifted singers in the country. He uh, was on staff at First Baptist Atlanta, their resident artist. That's what they called him. He was the res- he's the resident artist at the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. What a voice. Daniel lives near me. He sings at our student camp and He's been a dear friend now for 10 years or so, Judy. I'll be with Daniel next week in Missouri. Daniel's been singing gospel music for 13 years. Students, Daniel's what? What, Judy, 35? Been singing for 13 years. He stays busy. One of the busiest singers in America, like Michael Combs. Daniel got saved last summer. Last summer. In a revival I was preaching at that church I talked about in Tennessee for 29 years. On Sunday morning, Daniel, who had sung the stars down, he had just got up and sung about the amazing grace of God. He came to the altar and got on his knees. And I saw that he was weeping and weeping and wouldn't quit. He wanted to come by my hotel room one night troubled. And he said, Brother Rick, something happened to me at that altar Sunday morning. He said, Brother Rick, I've been in church all my life. I was baptized as a child. I sing gospel music, but something happened to me. And I'm trying to work it all out. And we prayed together. And I said, Daniel, God will show you what happened at that altar. Daniel got up the the next night, Gary, and testified, I got saved on Sunday morning at that altar. And students, he made this statement. You might be wondering, how can a person sing gospel music for 13 years and be lost? But Matthew 7 says, many will come to Jesus one day saying, Lord, I've preached in your name and I've done miracles in your name and I've cast out demons in your name. Folks, a lot of people have ability and they have it from the outside. But Daniel that day experienced a change of heart. And I'm going to tell you, I've heard him sing now for 10 years. I ain't never heard him sing like I have the last year because now he's a saved singer that man who sings before millions millions on the internet on radio large Bible conferences that man who, who has sung before millions was not ashamed to stand and testify I was lost but I got saved. And I'm going to tell you something. There's somebody sitting at I Know Baptist Church tonight who loves Gary Winstead, loves this church, but you're lost or you suspect you're lost and you're going to let the size of this crowd or your pride or what everybody thinks keep you from getting it right. Get it right. Get it right. Because you're going to stand before the judge. I'm closing. Simple sermon. I told you it's going to be simple. First of all, there's the face of the judge that's on the throne. It's a vision. There's the vision of the judge, and then there's the voice of the judge. And I'm closing, students. Hear this last one, and you've been awesome tonight. There's the verdict of the judge. First, there's the vision, then there's the voice, then there's the verdict. He says in verse 14, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Brother Rick, I don't believe in hell. There's only one problem. You don't get a vote. You know, saying God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Oh, no. God said it, that settles it. It don't make no difference whether you believe it or not. What you're going to do is gamble with your eternal destiny that there's not a hell. So I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. And I want you to hear this as I wrap this sermon up. This simple sermon. I want you to imagine the crowd at the judgment. It's hard to imagine. Imagine. Okay? For the sinners, there will be hell. For students, here's what he says. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. I'm a hellfire preacher. And the only reason I say this is because I believe there's a hell. A lot of preachers won't preach on hell. I'm not bragging on me or bragging on Brother Gary. I had a man in the vestibule, the lobby a couple nights ago, said the church he used to attend, the pastor wouldn't preach on hell. Another man told me that he got rebuked for preaching on hell. Do you know every 10 verses Jesus spoke in the New Testament, one of the 10 he spoke on hell? He preached more on hell than he did on heaven. The greatest hellfire preacher that ever lived was Jesus Christ. And you say, Rick, why in the world would Jesus preach so much on hell? He don't want you to go there. A preacher that stands with compassion and preaches on hell ought to be prayed for. You ought to pray for your pastor. But he preaches on hell. Students, in late April, it was a Friday night, I was home. And I believe there's a hell, but God got my attention to be more passionate when I preach on hell. I'll drink that uh, throat coat occasionally. I don't know what that is. It's a, it's a herbal tea, uh, hot tea. It's really good. A lot of singers and preachers take it, and I, I'll drink it. It's called throat coat. And I was home, it was a Friday night, but Judy and I were getting ready to head out of town. We were going to drive to a revival meeting in Central Florida the next day. And I had heated up my throat coat in the microwave. Two minutes. Because I like it hot, I'd rather it cool down. I'd rather overheat my food and cool it down. 
So I heated up for two minutes, students, and Judy was there. Our two granddaddies, we were keeping two of our grandbabies that night at the house, and I was, wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. I think I was watching a ball game through the portal in the kitchen on the TV. I don't know what I was doing. I wasn't paying attention. And I reached over for something on the counter, and the tea bag, the white part of the tea bag hanging out, drug across that counter, and I spilled. Seconds had to come out of the microwave, two minutes. I spilled it on my arm. My, my Lord, my arms have taken a beating this year, man. First it's the right arm and then the left arm. But I spilled that tea, students, on my flesh. And it's, it's pretty good now. It was awful. And my flesh instantly began to fall on the floor. Right there. It was horrifying. I'd never really been burned bad. I've been burned, but not like that. My flesh began to fall on the floor. And I was freaked out. And I drove myself to the emergency room. Didn't put nothing on it. I did it myself. Judy had the grandbabies. Emergency room is 10 minutes from our house. So at 10 o'clock on Friday night, I drove myself to the emergency room. And I'm a full-grown man, and this hurt awful bad. But when I came in that room that night, I could not hardly sit down. Because if you know anything about burning, it burns from the inside out. And it just kept burning and burning and throbbing and throbbing. I was the only, can you believe it, on a Friday night in Jacksonville, Florida, I was the only one in that emergency room. It's amazing. But I, they made me sit there about 15 minutes. I filled out everything I could fill out, and I thought, I've got to have for some relief. And students, they finally took me back there, and they talked to me and took my blood pressure, and I said, I know my blood pressure. It's hot. It's hot. And they kept taking my blood pressure and everything, but I thought, I've got to have some relief. And finally, a little nurse came in. Bless her heart. She's the only one that did this. And she put some kind of a blanket down, a paper blanket looking thing down, laid my arm on it and took cool water. Not cold water, you nurses know this, but cool water. And she began to pour that on my arm. And Brother Gary, I just wanted to sing, sing. So I, I got so happy. I was so relieved that inside pain stopped because that cool water began to hit my flesh. And she said, the doctor will be with you in a moment, and you know how that goes. You might sit there, I don't know, I know people are busy, and everybody's hurting. But, but she left, and 10 minutes later, here it comes again. Here it comes. So I'm going to tell you all what I did, son. She had left the bottle there with a cup, and I poured it myself, and I poured that cool water on that burn, and I did it another time before the doctor ever came in. And you might think that's a ridiculous story, but I'm going to tell you, I believe the Bible is literal. And I believe people in hell are burning and they burn forever and they can't get cool water on the arm. They can't even get a drop of water. And I'm telling you, they go to hell because they're stubborn and because they're proud and because of the size of a crowd and because they will not admit they're sinners and because they don't want anybody to talk about them. And it is not worth it. Right. Amen. Somebody here needs to get saved. Because I'm telling you this, the verdict of the judge is final. Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, I never knew you. But I'm not finished. It's going to be the most different great white throne sermon you've ever heard. I'm closing with this. Brother Gary, we've had a great revival, but i got to close to the church. Because I believe this great white throne, sinners will be in hell. But I believe saints could be heartbroken. So Brother Gary, the question comes that every preacher gets asked, will we see it? That's the question. Well, we see it. Well, those of us who are the redeemed, who've already been raptured, who've already gone through the judgment seat of Christ, have already been in heaven for these seven years during the tribulation, well, Brother Gary, will we see the great white throne judgment? Will we? Will God allow us to look? It's horrible to talk about. And what's going on in that court, you say, no, Brother Rick, because we're not going to cry in heaven. Oh, buddy, God don't wipe our tears away to the 21st chapter. He don't wipe our tears away to Revelation 21.4. And you might think I'm a legalist, but I'm one of those preachers that believe in the chronological order of the book of Revelation. Now, you can go ahead and argue me what you want to. That's why I'm pre-trib. I do believe I'm going to be raptured before it all starts. Hallelujah, man. If you want to stay, have a good time. I'm checking out, buddy, at the rapture of the church. And I do not believe, Brother Gary, God wipes our tears away until Revelation 21.4. Say, Rick, are you saying we're going to see the great white throne and weep over people? I don't know. I've heard preachers argue for and against students. I don't know if we're going to see the great white throne. 
But imagine for a moment, we do. Imagine that God allows us to see our next door neighbor, or our family, or a student at school, or that person that we never told about Jesus. Some are never prayed for their soul. What if God allows us to see that? So I leave you with these words in this wonderful revival. I know you're a big church, got a lot of people here, but there's a lost world all around you. And don't get so caught up in the aquarium that you forget how to fish. In 1985, September, the city of New Orleans had a party at the largest pool in the city. And the party was to celebrate. You know what they were celebrating, students? They were celebrating the fact that not one person had drowned in any of the New Orleans pools all over the city for the first time in years. There were 300 people at the exclusive party. 100 of them were lifeguards. A lot of music, a lot of drinking, a lot of fun. And while they're around that pool, near the end of the party, somebody noticed and screamed that a fully clothed man was laying down at the bottom of the pool near the drain. Somehow in all the music and the festivities and nobody was swimming, somebody had missed watching that man fall in that pool. They tried to revive him, but they could not. He drowned. And preacher, when I thought about that, here's what I thought about. That man drowned, surrounded by lifeguards who were celebrating their success. I'm going to say that one more time. That man drowned, surrounded by lifeguards who were celebrating their success. Don't get so caught up in what we're doing that we forget they need you out there. Would you bow with me all over the building? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask everybody.